Um, we will be in John chapter 5, starting at verse 16. And uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father, we come to you today in thankfulness for this day that you've given us. And uh, pray that um, you would help us to use this word to help us to draw closer to you. Uh, pray for those who are down the hall working with the younger kids and with the teens who bless that time. And pray for the morning worship service as those bringing the songs, as pastor brings the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Oops. So, uh, to kind of put this in, in context as far as where we are, we're still in the section of um, John that's kind of considered the book of signs, where there are seven miraculous signs that are recorded to show the authenticity of Jesus' words. And there are seven discourses or seven conversations that he has that are th spread out throughout that. Um, last week, we saw the second and third of the two signs, the third sign being healing the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, which is where chapter 5 starts. And this section is the third discourse. The first two were more of a back and forth conversation, as the first one was a conversation with Jesus and Nicodemus about the nature of the true spiritual birth. And then the second conversation was between Jesus and the Samaritan woman and the kind of true nature of worship and true nature of faith. And with the conversation with Nicodemus, though Nicodemus does come eventually to become a believer as evidenced by his actions in John chapter 19, in the conversation that he and Jesus has, he is silenced. And there is no proclamation there of him responding to Jesus' words. Whereas with the Samaritan woman, there's a strong response from the woman that she believes his words, she shares his, her, his words with others, and others believe. So we've seen so far in the Gospel of John that any time somebody accepts and believes, they accept those words, they proclaim those words, and they share those words with someone else. Whereas generally when the words are not well received, the individual is silenced. And here in this discourse, it's less of a conversation back and forth and more of a monologue where Jesus himself is proclaiming truth about himself. And this particular passage is one of the strongest statements in the Gospels that Jesus himself makes in terms of equating himself with God the Father and being equal with God the Father as being God the Son. And with this, we pretty much see throughout the entire discourse here, those he's directly speaking to are completely silenced and completely silent at the end of it. We also see that this kind of links up with the previous sign, the, the lame man being, being healed at the pool. In the, the lame man was waiting there with many others who had great need at this pool that they believed had mystical powers for the moving of the waters so that they'd be healed. And they completely missed that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was moving through them as he was traveling from Galilee to, to Jerusalem and passing through where this pool would have been, just north of Jerusalem at the Sheep Gate. And they completely missed this. But Jesus still saw the need and specifically chose this individual lame man who'd been lame for 38 years and asked him if he wanted to be healed and healed him physically first. And since this is on the Sabbath, when the man picked up his, his stretcher or pallet that he had been carried on, and by Pharisaic laws that surrounded the Sabbath, it would have been acceptable 
for other people to carry him on his stretcher when he was paralyzed. But once he was healed miraculously, it was now a breach of their work laws that they had developed to surround the true nature of the Sabbath, that he was now in violation. So they, they approach him and are like, why are you carrying your, your stretcher on, on the Sabbath? And he's like, well, the man who healed me told me to get up, walk, and carry it. And so now they shift they shifted their focus from this man who was carrying the stretcher to who told you this? And he had no idea. Because he had completely, even when he was healed, he had completely missed who had healed him. He had completely missed that he was face to face with the Son of God. And so later, Jesus approached him in the temple and tells him, now that you're physically healed, you need to be spiritually healed because there's a worse judgment coming. If you're not spiritually healed, you need to sin no more. And at that point, there's not a clear indication in the passage that the individual understands who he's talking to. He still seems to be not understanding that this is the Son of God, this is the Messiah. This isn't just somebody who's coming by in the temple with good life wisdom like one of the rabbis might. And so he takes this information back to those who question him, the Jewish leadership, and points out who the individual is. But there doesn't seem to be any indication that in doing that, he is proclaiming Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins, as John the Baptist did. It's just he's pointing him out and saying, oh, you asked me earlier who, who told me to do this. It was that guy over there. And so the setting for this is a miraculous sign that Jesus has done, but there just seems to be this complete lack of recognition of who he is, which carries over into kind of the introduction to this section. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so this section of John chapter 5 can kind of be broken into three parts. Verses 16 to 18 is about the only section where anybody other than Jesus speaks. And this is an accusation where Jesus is excused of breaking the Sabbath and of blasphemy. So starting in John chapter 5, verse 16. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And here's a reminder in the Gospel of John, when we have the Jews with the capital letter, it's not referring to the Jewish nation as a whole or all Jewish people. It's referring to the Jewish leadership. And in the Gospel of John, the Jewish leadership as far as primarily kind of this elite group of Pharisees who are controlling worship in the temple. Um, the Sadducees would be part of that group also, but they don't really seem to play that much as far as being specifically mentioned in the Gospel of John as much as they are in some of the other Gospels. And so they have two accusations or two complaints. One, that he had the audacity to heal a lame man who had been lame for 38 years on the Sabbath and not only did he heal the lame man, but he told the lame man to get up and do work, basically. Which, though that wouldn't have been a violation of God's intent for the Sabbath, it was a violation of all of the rules and traditions that the Pharisees had built up around the Sabbath as this large hedge so they wouldn't break the Sabbath. The problem was they had made that large hedge of rules so big that they had lost sight of the actual purpose of the Sabbath and what the Sabbath was really for. 
there were provisions in that, that Pharisaic law to heal on the Sabbath without breaking the Sabbath, but it only was allowed to be done if the individual who needed to be healed was in imminent danger of dying. Otherwise, it could wait till the next day. And so they're probably looking at this, well, this guy was lame for 38 years. Couldn't that have waited another day? Completely missing just the callous attitude of that. And then also missing this guy had been lame for 38 day, 38 years, and suddenly somebody heals him. Maybe this person who heals him has the authority of God and maybe is God. And one of the other exceptions to work on the Sabbath was God's allowed to work on the Sabbath because they recognized that God's work didn't end in the six days of creation and then he's just still resting. It's that his work continues and continues through the Sabbath. Which is why when Jesus' response to them when they approach him and accuse him of doing work on the Sabbath, is to say, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. He's basically saying to them that he is God. He's equating himself with God. He's not saying he's a prophet who's beneath God and does God's doing. He's equating himself as far as the son is equal to the father. And so this is why it ratchets up. They want to kill him even more because from their perspective, they still do not see that he has authority to do this because he's God. He's the one who met with Moses and gave the Ten Commandments that included the laws about keeping the Sabbath. So if anyone knows how to keep the Sabbath, it would be the one who met with Moses and gave those commandments. But they don't recognize this, and so it's understandable from their perspective that they're now thinking, well, this person's saying he's God. This is blasphemy. And blasphemy in Old Testament law was to be punished by death. And so in some ways, their foundation is kind of right as they're looking to the scriptures. But on the other hand, they've completely missed that the Old Testament scriptures were pointing towards this day when the Messiah, the Redeemer, would come, who they've been watching for and have completely missed. Just like all the individuals who are in great need, including the individuals lame at the Pool of Bethesda, they were waiting for the moving of the waters and they were looking for the wrong thing when the Son of God himself walks and moves through them. And here we see the same thing. They've completely missed that. So in verses 16 to 18, the, the, Jesus is excuse, excused of breaking the Sabbath and blasphemy, and the Jewish leadership seek to kill him because of this. Verses 19 to 30, the first part of Jesus' discourse and monologue here is he presents four defenses that why he has the authority he does. And then that's followed by verses 31 to 47, where Jesus presents four witnesses that speak to his authority. And so this section here in chapter 5 is almost laid out like a court trial. 16 to 18 is the accusations that are laid against Jesus, and then 19 to 30, he outlines his defense. And then 31 to 47, he shows his supporting witnesses that support his defense. And at the end of this, we do not see his accusers saying anything. They're silenced. Now, whether they believe or not, it's unlikely that those he was talking directly to believed at that time because we've seen a pattern in the Gospel of John that those who believe, they proclaim it and they share it, whereas those who don't believe are silenced. But this passage also is a passage that not just for those individuals that Jesus was talking about it to at that time, but it's for anybody who reads this to see the accusations against Jesus and then see his defense and the supporting witnesses, and each one of those has to decide who reads that, will we believe, proclaim, and share that, 
Or will we be silenced by this? So let's continue on in verse 19. So then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. So Jesus is pointing out that even though the Father and Son are distinct, they're one. He cannot act without the authority of the Father. He does not act without the authority of the Father. He can't because he and the Father are one. So here he is starting um, his defense by kind of doubling down and saying, well, yeah, it's not blasphemy for him to say he's equal with God because he is equal with God. And that it is not him breaking the Sabbath by doing miraculous works in the Sabbath, because that's the Father's work. That's what the Father does. The Father has continual work that he is doing, and the Son is not doing a different work. He is doing his Father's work. It goes on, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things, and he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even to the Son, gives life to whom he will. And so Jesus is pointing out that he and the Father are one. He is pointing out directly to his Jewish audiences listening to him that he is in fact the Son of God. He is in fact God himself, but also presenting to the listeners that the one God has a multiple parts. Here the Spirit isn't directly mentioned, so the full Trinity isn't mentioned here, but the Son and the Father are mentioned. So this passage is both reinforcing that there is one God who has one goal and one mission, and there's a oneness between the Father and the Son because the Son is God. But it's also showing that there's a distinct nature between the two of them. The Father and the Son are distinct. So his teaching both, there's one God, and that one God has multiple parts. And so his first of four defenses is that he hasn't broken the Sabbath because he's doing his Father's work, and his Father is the one who handed down the law of the Sabbath to Moses and to the Israelites. So the second defense starting in verse 22. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So first kind of working our backwards, to be sent was understood more than just casually, oh, you know, could you run down to the convenience store to get milk? And I was sent to get milk at the convenience store or something. This term here is, is indicating a legally binding relationship that the one who is sent is regarded to be just as the one who sent them. The individual who's sent has this legal relationship that they are doing what the one who sent them told them to do and fully, 100% represent them. Um, in the Old Testament, when a prophet was sent by God, it was understood that when the prophet was speaking, the words he was speaking were as if God was speaking directly. Even when a human king sent an emissary, that emissary who was sent, it was understood that his words, even though he wasn't the king, his words carry the full weight and the full authority of whoever sent him. And so the authority that Jesus has been given, that Son has been given, is that he has been given the authority from God the Father for judgment. And it's showing here that Jesus is the intermediary between God the Father, and all of humanity. It is only through Jesus that we can go 
to the Father. And the only reason that works is because Jesus was given the authority to do that. And he can have that authority because he's one with the Father. And really, kind of skipping ahead, that's the whole reason he came, because the temple, which was the place where the Jews would go, and the high priest would give an offering to approach God so their sins could be forgiven. And that offering of the lamb had to be given over and over again because it was just a temporary picture of what Jesus was going to do. And Jesus came a few chapters ago, cleansed the temple, and made a reference to his body as being the temple, as being the true place. And so we also see in this part of this defense is he's pointing back to the Old Testament Jewish traditions, the Old Testament Jewish laws that were pointing to the need for a blood sacrifice, a need for the sins to be forgiven, that he was going to fulfill once and for all and replace the need for the temple and the high priest being the intermediary between man and God because Jesus is the perfect intermediary between man and God. And so he's been given full authority. Now also, to the Jewish audiences listening to this, their understanding of the Old Testament scriptures is the only one who has the full authority to judge is God himself. So they would recognize that Jesus is saying his first defense is he's the son of God, so he does what God the Father does. He and the Father are one. The second one, he has authority to judge. Well, from the Jewish perspective, who he's talking to, they would know from the scriptures that he was saying that he had to be God because otherwise he wouldn't have that authority. They understood that in a small temporary way, God might allow a human agent to have certain judgment, like in human government, but not the same as the full authority to fully judge and Jesus makes it very plain in saying, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. He's saying there that it's not that he's been given partial authority, he's been given full authority. And so that's a second defense. And so then the third, verse 24 which is kind of central to this passage because this one is really important. Because it's not just a proof, but it's also a promise of hope. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. So Jesus follows up by saying that he's been given the authority to judge, and he's also been given the power to give everlasting life. And the Jewish audience would have directly recognized the only one in the Old Testament scriptures who had the authority and the power to give everlasting life would be God himself. So Jesus is saying that because he has the ability to give everlasting life, he is one with the Father, he is God, and he is not blaspheming because he's God. But also in here, there's a promise. They've just been told that the Son has the authority to give judgment, and now they're being told that those who hear the Son's words and believes in him will not come into judgment and will be passed from death into life. They will be given, that we will be given, spiritual life. Tying back to the conversation he had with Nicodemus. True life, true hope comes from being born not just again, but born from above of the Spirit. And how the, in that conversation, discourse with Nicodemus, there was a word play in the Greek word anothen, to be born again also meant to be born from above of the Spirit. 
And here he's proclaiming to this group of Jews he's talking to that that power to be born from above comes from hearing his word and believing his word and receiving life. It doesn't come from following the laws that he's being accused of breaking. It doesn't come from perfectly following the 1,500 regulations that the Pharisees had enacted to cover what you did on the Sabbath. 1,500. There were 39 different classes of work that you couldn't do. Just keeping those tra straight on that one day of the week, how could anyone do that? But yet that was what it had become. They had lost sight that the law was to point the Israelites and those who saw the Israelites as being unique people, their need for forgiveness from God, their need to bring the lamb sacrifices every year, their need to go bring those to the priest who would give them to God and then meet with God in the Holy of Holiest. They completely miss that all of those that point to that, and here's the Son of God himself saying it's about belief in him, hearing his word and believing. And we've seen how the, John the Baptist proclaimed that. We've seen how the, the disciples accepted that and proclaimed it. We saw the Samaritan woman accepted that and proclaimed it. Yet these individuals who are so steeped in the Old Testament scripture, they're missing it. This also highlights a theme that we've seen in the Gospel of John in that authentic faith is belief in Jesus' words, not his signs. We've seen that as far as Jesus has been kind of suspicious of those who followed him because of his miracles, as opposed to those like the Samaritans or his disciples who followed him because of his words and then saw his miraculous signs as authentication of his words. So they believed in his words. And we also saw... The second sign, the nobleman's son being healed. The nobleman's son being healed, the nobleman's son was at the point of death. He came to Jesus, come and heal my son. son. Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he sends his word and says, your son will be healed. And the man believes on Jesus' word and goes back and finds that his son has been healed and was healed, which authenticated his faith in those words. And he then proclaims that to the rest of his family, and they believe. So in that miracle, we see an individual who had a need, who believed Jesus' word, and then the miracle authenticated Jesus' word, and then he shared and proclaimed that word, and others believed. We didn't see that with the lame man at the pool of uh, Bethsaida. But we still do it at the pool of Bethsaida. It was, again, Jesus' word that healed the man. So here he's emphasizing that he has power and authority through his word to give everlasting life and so that those who believe will not come into judgment, will pass from death into life. So then the fourth defense he gives is in 25 to 30. Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, but the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing as I hear. I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. So here the fourth defense is Jesus is saying he has the power to resurrect the dead. 
And again, the Jews would recognize the only one in the Old Testament scriptures who had the power to resurrect the dead is God himself. And in this one, Jesus also references all three of the previous defenses. He references that he and the Father are one. He references he has been given authority to judge, and because he's been given authority to judge, he can give life, and he can resurrect those from the dead. And then it also shows again and echoes that he has the power to give life. The wording of verse 25 is kind of interesting, and it says, Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. So first, the hour is coming. He's talking about a future event here. He's talking about a future event when the dead in Christ will rise and be resurrected, will have a physical resurrection from death. And that is a future event. That he has power that when he speaks, those who are dead in Christ, their bodies will be physically resurrected. But it also says, and now is. Well, those he's been talking to, whether it was Nicodemus, whether it's a Samaritan woman, whether it's the Jewish audience he's talking to, or whether those who are reading the Gospel of John. Nicodemus was in darkness. The Samaritan woman was in darkness. His audience is in darkness. They're all spiritually dead. He's saying, the time now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. He's telling them that right now, they, his audience, are spiritually dead, and right now, they are hearing the voice of the Son of God. They are hearing the words of life. And those who hear and believe, as the previous verse said, those who hear my words and believe in him who sent me has everlasting life. So here there's kind of this double thing of looking forward to the resurrection of the dead physically, but also then looking to the right now, whether right now is right now reading the Gospel of John or when Jesus was speaking these words. Anyone who hears them who is spiritually dead is hearing the words of God, and if they accept them, they will have spiritual life. And then we'll be part of that future resurrection of the dead. This also echoes back to the two most recent signs or miracles that we saw last week. In both of them, the Son of God speaks and restoration happens. In the one case, he spoke and the nobleman's son at the door of death was restored life. The man who is lame for 38 years, Jesus spoke, and immediately his dead limbs were brought to life. So we have this discourse back to back with those particular signs for a specific reason. Jesus isn't saying or teaching something different with his signs than he's saying with his words. They all go together. Also in verse 25, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of God, and in verse 27, he refers to himself as the Son of Man, showing that he is fully God and fully man. He uses both titles here that are used throughout the Gospels to emphasize Son of Man, to emphasize his humanity, Son of God, to enter, emphasize his oneness with God. And here he uses in this defense both of those to make it very clear to the audience that he is claiming to be fully man and fully God. It's verse 29. Now in verse 29, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. This is not an argument for salvation by works. This is not saying that those who have done good works of resurrection of life, and those who are evil will have resurrection of condemnation. It's saying that the works, the good works, in the context here is very clear that life comes through the words and the belief in words in Jesus Christ. 
And so in that context, it's saying that these works are the result of the life that Jesus gives because of belief. We are able to do good works not so we can attain salvation, because we can't do that. Those 1,500 rules are on the Sabbath and that sort of thing. Um, here it is saying that those who believe, those who have life because they believe, will do good works. So at the time of the resurrection of life, those will be the ones who good works, and those who are condemned, the ones who do not believe, will be outside that. Further, in John 6, 28 and 29, Jesus comes right out and defines what he means by the good works of God. So his disciples say, they say to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? So they're asking him, what can we do to do good works? And his response is, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he sent. So even Jesus himself is here defining that the first good work is believing and having life because of that belief, because we are insufficient in order to do enough good works to attain everlasting life. So verse 29 is not an argument for salvation by works hiding in here. It's rather the result of God's work through Jesus' work in salvation and belief in him. So, moving on to the third section. And the third section is now that Jesus has lined out these reasons why he is God, basically, the nature and identity of himself that he reveals, he now brings forth four supporting witnesses to support that this is a true witness. Now this starts a little bit weird in that it starts with verse 531 where Jesus says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. And that might seem a weird thing to say, especially if we read that as Jesus saying, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is a lie. Because God can't lie and he just got done supporting that he and God are one, so he can't lie. Some commentators say that here, my witness is not true, would be better read, my witness is not sufficient or not complete. Jesus has just finished saying that he has all of his authority to judge everything because he's one with the Father. He, by himself, separate from the Father, is not complete and is not sufficient and therefore is not true. He is only complete and sufficient and true when he and the Father are one. And since he and the Father is one, his sufficiency comes from the oneness with the Father. The other factor that comes into play here is he's talking to a Jewish audience who's focused on the Old Testament Jewish law, and not wrongly so. It's just they've misinterpreted what he was telling them. So in this, he's pointing out to them things to adjust how they understand the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 19.15, Moses lays down the Mosaic law, one witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. So Jesus is basically telling him, them, this is kind of like a court setting, 16 to 18 were the accusations, um, 19 to 30 were four defenses, and now are the supporting witnesses. And Jesus is acknowledging that the Old Testament scriptures are true. And what Moses said, one witness shall not rise against, there needs to be two or three witnesses, is true. And so because of that, Jesus is saying to fulfill that, he's going to give more than one witness. He's going to give not two, not three, but four witnesses. So he's showing them, you are bringing accusations that he had committed, that Jesus committed blasphemy and broken the Sabbath. He's defending himself of those accusations. 
And under Jewish Mosaic law, he needs to provide at least two or three witnesses, not just his own witness. To do just his own witness would not be true, would not be sufficient, would not be complete. There had to be more. And instead of doing two, instead of doing three, he goes with four, one more than was necessary to show his truth. And so those four witnesses then, the first in 31 to 35 is John the Baptist. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that that witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, and this would be John the Baptist, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yeah, I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But they had missed John the Baptist's full message. John the Baptist's full message was to point to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and they had not accepted John the Baptist's full message. But Jesus is telling them, you went and questioned John the Baptist, and John the Baptist proclaimed as a witness, independent of Jesus, that John the Baptist was not the Messiah, and that he was proclaiming the Messiah, who is Jesus. And so that is his first witness. And his first witness was introduced in the, in the introduction as there was a man sent from God whose name was John, this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. So that witness was pointing to the hope that Jesus is giving in his defense, that those who believe will have life. But not only that, John the Baptist wasn't a random witness with no authority. He was a witness who had authority because he was sent from God. So ultimately, John's witness is a witness that God the Father is witnessing to the authenticity of Jesus. Again, he's only complete if the Son and the Father are not taken separately. So the second would be the signs that Jesus did for authentication. So in verse 36, but I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. So again, he's reinforcing. His authority comes because he's sent from the Father. His authority comes because he's been given power to do works from the Father, because he as the Son is one with the Father. So his second evidence is the miraculous signs to authenticate that his words are true. Even though the emphasis in the Gospel of John is that true faith is believing the words rather than the miraculous signs, Jesus still did those miraculous signs, this authentication for his words, so that like the noblemen who believed by faith Jesus' words, he then saw that his faith wasn't empty with the authentication of his son actually living and then the rest of his family believing. And then the third is the Father himself. So in verse 37, And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. Now it's not recorded in the Gospel of John, but in the Gospel of Matthew, when John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, we have the Spirit descending on Jesus and the voice of God saying, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. The voice of God, this is a reference here. Jesus is saying that his, his baptism, people heard and people saw the voice of God and the Spirit of God descending on him. Now, that's not specifically mentioned in the Gospel of John, but John the Baptist does mention in, in the Gospel of John that he knows and witnesses that Jesus is the Messiah because he saw this event. He saw the Spirit descending and remaining on Jesus. But here, along with Jesus saying that God's voice, the voice of God authenticated him, he also goes on now to not just show a witness and a defense for himself, but now he starts to accuse the audience. 
And he starts to say, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent, him you do not believe. So now he's starting to, to accuse them from a position of authority that he can judge them that they have rejected the Son and the Father. And so in 39 to 47, his final witness is the scripture in Moses. And this is very fitting because his audience here, the Jewish religious leadership, they know the scripture really well. They've just under, misunderstood how it's applied and they've lost sight. The scripture is pointing to Jesus. One of the commentators that have been using um, made the following statement. The Bible, yes, even the Old Testament is about Jesus. To read the Old Testament in another way, according to Jesus himself, is to read the Old Testament like the disbelieving Jews in this passage. And it goes on to say, well, actually, I'll leave that if I have time. So verses 39 to 47, Jesus now says the scriptures and Moses himself is a witness to his truth. In 39, you search the scriptures for them. You think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. He's saying, despite their good method and good content, the good method being searching the scripture, good content being the scripture itself, the word of God itself. However, the problem is they miss that the Old Testament was about the coming Messiah. They completely miss that. And he goes on to say, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. They recognize the scripture, but they don't recognize what it's about. And he goes on to say, I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. So in this defense, he's saying the scripture speaks to him and they are not believing and following the scripture. And 42, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him will you receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? He is saying that they put trust in their self rather than in God. They've rejected God's standard in favor of human standards. Now that human standards, they have a good foundation for it, the scripture, but the problem was what they built on that was wrong. And ironically with this, a commentator goes on to say that while we loved ourselves, God loved us. And while we would sacrifice everything else for ourselves, God sacrificed himself for everyone else. And so then this closes with verses 45 to 47, which this final piece of the defense is not just Jesus supporting himself at this point, that he hasn't broken the Sabbath and he hasn't committed blasphemy, but he's now pronouncing judgment against his audience through Moses, who would have been the prophet that they looked to of all prophets. He was the one that they believed and who did meet with God to receive the Mosaic law that their entire Pharisaic law was based on. So 45, do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So he closes his final closing arguments by pointing out to him that they were accusing him of breaking the Sabbath and acts of blasphemy. The fourth commandment was handed down through Moses to keep the Sabbath holy. He's now turning the tables on them and saying Moses himself, the one who God had give you this law, accuses you. And that if you do not believe and understand Moses truly, you do not believe and understand Jesus' words, and they, because of that, they will not have life 
that he offered in the middle of this passage. Next week, John 6, 1 through 21, and sorry for going way over. Um, Dear Only Father, we thank you for these words that you've given us. Help us to draw closer to you and to keep focus on the true nature of your word rather than the rules and traditions and our own selfish desires. In Jesus' name, amen.